He was the guy that I could call at any time and he would say, I'll be there in 10 minutes or I can't get there till tomorrow, but he would show up. He always helped me, transported art from here to there. He called whenever I needed him. He was a gallery greeter and he was our number one punch maker. I never had to worry about punch at a reception because Don not only made the punch, he went and got everything so I didn't have to think about it. It was just kind of his thing to be that one little small, all these little small places that he filled holes that nobody will ever understand. He was a procrastinator. <laughs> he was um, a storyteller. And he was a storyteller in a way, and I don't want to take it away from anybody else, but the thing I loved about Don, and the family has donated this piece to Ridge Art when he won Best of Show for this last year at the Haines City Show. But if you look at any of Don's work, um, there is a story on the back of each. My daughter Leanne commissioned a piece for him five years ago. It took her like three years to get it because it was so incredible. It was winning awards everywhere and he didn't want to give it up. And then after she finally had it, he would borrow it back for shows for the art festival, etc. And that was Don. I think that he did that with Penrin as well, borrowed pieces back. But I just want y'all to know that he will greatly be missed at Ridge Art. And I appreciate all of y'all for showing up for him because he was a great guy. So the piece that I put on the front of the program is actually um, won the Banner Award a couple of years ago. And the banner with this piece on it is still hanging on the other side of the building. So if you're going over the overpass, that you can see it. It hung on the, over the stairs for a year, and now it's out there. So if you want to, to look and see, it's a little faded now because that side of the building gets a lot of sun. But it's still a wonderful tribute to Dawn. And now I would um, like to introduce his lifetime long friend for 48 years, Penman Craig. Watch the chords, baby. I'm not really a lifelong friend. Well, 48 years. I met Don um, like the first week of college in Georgia many years ago. And he was this cute guy, y'all. He was so cute, you can't imagine. And I didn't want him to stop talking to me. And he said, hey, do you like to party? And I said, well, well yeah. <laughs> and I want to tell you something. It's been a party ever since with Don, Donald Rustone Jr. He was an adventurer. And together, we were able to travel from the Everglades to Canada back many times, stopping along the way at museums, at little remote places. Don was a researcher, y'all. He was always digging up tidbits of information, and he kept clippings, just like his mother did, for many, many, many things. And so we'd be driving along, and let's say the sign said Kalamazoo four miles. He'd go, oh, wait, I remember. There's a blah, 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 blah. We got to go see. And er, we did, because there was no timetable. That's the way Don was. He was this ubiquitous, fun, inquisitive, mischievous, grinning, sardonic, sarcastic, rebellious soul person. And I want to say one thing before I forget. Carry this with you, as you remember Don. He lived his life the way he wanted to live it. He really did. He had a good time, y'all. He loved his family. He loved his friends. And I want to share just a little bit before he became an artist. Because I know a lot of you here associate him through the stories that you've learned and the persona that he is as an artist. I jotted down just a few notes. I don't want to talk too long. Um, imagine doing this in a thousand years. Don was always going to be here. He was my, my heart, my lifelong, almost lifelong person. Um, sorry. You know, art was really only his passion the past 22 or so years. And I want to bring you up to that point. As a kid, Don was interested in lots of things. He collected matchbox cars. 
And he was always meticulous. I used to call him anal because he kept track of all his artwork, you know, and he'd have the number and the date and where it went and stuff like that. He kept track of his cars too, y'all, thousands of them. His brother is trying to go through them now and they're all still in boxes. That's our Don. He always kept track of things. He was interested in soccer. He loved the Tour de France. He loved watching those cyclists. It used to drive me insane, because you know, that thing's on for days, and it's just like people rolling around and around and around. <laughs> he liked things rolling around. He loved race cars. He loved Sebring, especially, I remember, and going to the track there. Um, he loved fancy, expensive automobiles, of which any of us would can probably only dream of, you know? And to this day, there are still stacks of DuPont car registry magazines in his bathroom. Um, that's what he read in the bathroom, folks. Um, he liked wheels. I don't know why this story just came to mind. I used to ride a bicycle for transportation. Hard to imagine today, I know. but. Um, <laughs> One time he came up to visit me in Lexington, Kentucky, and he took my bike up to the newsstand because he was also a bibliophile and a serial publication lover. All magazines, all newspapers. But he didn't want my bike. This is on University of Kentucky campus. It was gone when he came out. Um, and he went, eh, sorry. Have you heard him say that? <laughs> That's been around for a long time. Um, in addition to being a bibliophile, I mean bookstores, used bookstores, you know, <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of books he collected through the years. And I mean, he read everything from fiction. Um, oh, Platt Hustler yeah. was one of his favorite mystic mystery writers, but he also read books on politics and world history. And he was always abreast of current events and he could debate with any of us. And Donald did have his opinions, very strong ones, but he also knew when not to push a point. It was okay in many times, in many cases, to disagree, to have different viewpoints, but to still come together as friends, you know? And that's one of the things I admired about him. He loved to travel. He, uh, he traveled as a teenager, his grandfather paid to send him to France. And I've heard those stories forever. Um, he shared the stories with me and so did his mother. And many of you knew his mom, one of the most delightful humans on earth. Um, and she was so pleased to have her beautiful grandchildren and to be able to return the favors that her father had provided for her son in you know, sending her children and going with her, our grandchildren, going to Europe. Um, his mom and dad were interested in genealogy and Don picked up that love. And any of you who know Don Stone have heard him speak of his ancestry. Very, very proud of his New England heritage. It's a huge part of Don. And that love bounced back and forth. And you know, I would get letters from both Don and his mother and they would always talk about, oh, we discovered a ancestor here, or we found out that so-and-so did such and such at this place, and they were so excited, or as Don would say, <coughs> he was so pleased to learn. Um, his brother, y'all know as Henry, a lot of you, but I know as Sears, his middle name, family name, I met when he was uh, attending Don's college graduation. He was like, what, 18 years old? And he joined the Navy shortly thereafter. And Don was able to go visit him in Hawaii and you know, many places around the world. Um, Don was able to travel. It was a big part of him. Don never met a stranger. Y'all know this to be true. <laughs> he collected the stories of all of you. If you know Don, you're in his stories and he shared them with us. Um, I'm looking for someone who I've never met, and I don't know if he's here, and I know he's trying to get here, flying in from Boston. His plane's late, he's on his way, I talked to him this morning. Thank you. John, right? Hi, John. Hi, John. 
See, I've never met this man, but I know of him through Donald. Um, if he loved you, you knew it. He lived in the seaside, and, and I was going to mention this gentleman who's coming because it's important. If you know Don, you know this about him too. Um, and Don didn't care. It was the love of his life. And the fact that he's flying in from Boston just to be here today is huge. That's the kind of love that Donald R. Stone Jr. generated. Um, and when he gets here, I have to thank him. Don, again, would be so pleased. In fact, recently Don's been using a different term. He would be elated that all of you are here. It's just elated. You know, I lost touch with Don for a couple of years in the late 80s, or excuse me, late 90s. Life interfered, he was busy in Seaside, and um, they were significant years for him. His father passed away. His mother experienced a break-in at her house, and I've seen the letters back and forth about that in 1998. And Don wanted to be there for his mom, and he went there for his mom and stayed until a couple of weeks ago in that home. He took care of his mother. He took care of his family. He loved you all so much. I never had a conversation with Don or a letter from Don that he didn't tell me what y'all were up to. And he's so proud of his nieces and his nephew. Um, he may not have shown it, but he was. He is, okay? That's important for you to know. At the same time that I was kind of out of touch with him, his phone was disconnected. We didn't have cell phones, or he didn't have a cell phone back then. Funny met on Don, call his mom, right? And I called his mother, and we chatted for a minute. How are you? How's so-and-so? Blah, blah. And he, he said, oh, do you want to speak to Don? He just walked in the door. And we were reconnected. And I drove down to Florida, and he said, I'm an artist now. I'm like, yeah, right, Don, really? You're an artist? Because he always had kind of an eclectic <clears throat> grouping of jobs, never a career, until he was in his 40s, and art became that career, his love. And from that moment, um, I was gifted the status of traveling art companion with him to all the folk art shows around the southeast. I've been to many, many, many of them. Good Lord, y'all have had to love that tent, take it up down. And, and you know, Don is so precise. We were the last ones out of so many art shows. Mary Jo's laughing because she knows. You know, one time in Moorhead, Kentucky, at the Kentucky Folk Art Center, literally the janitors were trying to get us out the door. It was an interior show, but it's a big, heavy tent. He had a lot of heavy art. And um, we finally get out. It's dark. And we get everything loaded in his van, the same one that's out in the parking lot right now. And he slammed the door and he couldn't lift the handle. The handle fell off in his hand. Yeah. <laughs> These are adventures with Don. You know, it was going to be something quirky. And we turned it into a joke, a running joke for a long time. But it was scary at the moment. And it doesn't matter how we solved the problem. But we solved the problem. They were always solved. Um, at any rate, he. Uh, let me go to a lot of shows with both he and his mother, and I've met some beautiful, beautiful people through these years. People who love him a lot, and some who are here today. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, if you lost touch with him or if he got out of touch with you, believe me, he was always there in spirit because he continued to talk and ask and quest, as he would say. Uh, I don't know, I'm not going to talk about the art because, you know, other people are going to do that. Don was a collector. 
you should see his house. Right? <laughs> right, family? Right. He uh, collected information. He collected quotations. He always had the notebooks. He called them his second brain. He traveled with them everywhere. We used to write little notes back and forth. He would write in a journal. I would write in his his second brain. You know, just little things. I'd draw little cats. I love you, Don, so he'd find it later. You know? Just little things like that, but he always carried them with him. He always had his bags. He always had his hat. Got to do it. Um, he always knew things that would interest you, whoever you are. And when he saw you, he'd bring them up. Um, his stories turned into these. And you know, he always wrote them back. He always wrote the stories, and he always incorporated people that were important to him. You know, there's trucks that say pop, and little blonde heads swimming in water. That's me, um, and his parents. And you know, he would recall and share the stories of those things in his art. I have probably talked way too long, certainly longer than I intended to. I went to a gay bar with Don Stone one time in the late 80s, and the music was blaring so loud. It was called Backstreets in Atlanta, Georgia. It was blaring so loud, and he leaned across the table, and he took my hands because Diana Ross and the Supremes were singing, someday we'll be together again. And he said, Ken, someday we'll be together again. Someday, folks, we'll be together again, but for now, Don's really busy up there meeting all those ancestors he's <laughs> studied all these years, and it's all about the love, and I feel it in this room so strongly. He'll always, he is always a part of me, and I am so blessed to have had the best friend a girl could ever have, and to be included as part of this family. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I didn't know Don's art world at all. I, I'm just amazed at the number of people that are here. And I thank you all for being here. My family all thanks you. Um, as brothers go, he was a pretty good brother. He was a great uncle, a fantastic brother-in-law to my wife, Agnes and uh, good friends to Penny, Carlos when he's here. But I mean, he's just my big brother. I mean, we fought, we argued, we, we didn't mean things to each other. He was good with mom and dad, great with mom after dad passed away. He, um, I really, I don't know what else to say. I, the ancestry, uh, of course, is, is very dear to him, and, and now it's passed on to me, and it's got to go to one of my three, or going to have to, Sarah, Emily, or Joshua, are going to have to carry that on. And um, maybe I'll have a, another stone down the line if somebody gets a good work. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> This is all foreign to me. I mean, my, my art ends with, you know, dogs playing poker on pills. <laughs> after, after that, I, I, you know, I don't know anything. I, I think I drew, drew, drew a Snoopy once as a kid. They put it on an ashtray for my dad. Other than that, I don't know anything about it. I'm, and there's a ton of art, it's things I've never seen before. And Penny brought up some things about art shows. I don't know about those. I, I just wasn't part of that world. But it, we would spend every summer at the beach. And um, on the way back, we'd come across the bridge there on 17. And off to the right was the uh, school buses lot. And I would cringe every year when we came home, because I knew that at the end of the summer, that meant I had to go back to school. And unlike Don, I, I wasn't too fond of school. And, wasn't the greatest student. Don was very good at that. And he would uh, 
look forward to you know going back and but not me. And apparently somewhere down the line that was a uh, a uh, inspiration for one of his first paintings. And um, I know there's an article in one of these magazines. I'm not. What's the name of it? H63 with that says about that. But I thank you all for coming and what will happen is uh, we've had Don cremated and here in June or so we will take him back up to Cape Cod and with the help of our dear aunt we will take him out. and spread them out there with his, our parents off of the State Harbor Lighthouse and he'll be there to see. I thank you all for coming out. I'm sorry. I must think that Penny was at least very close to being the love of his life. Who was Don Stone? Can you hear me? It looks like I'm sort of losing my voice. Who was Don Stone? He was a man who was always willing to help. You know, he was there. He was a man with a great sense of humor. He was a man who held my hand as I walked over a curb. I prayed I wouldn't do this. Don was a man who liked to talk about art. Not just his art, but art. And his other favorite subject was his family. He was, um, he loved rich art. He um, loved, he adored his two nieces, Sarah and Emily, and his nephew, Josh. He loved his two cats, Hannibal and Thomas. He also enjoyed, he also enjoyed stealing the fried okra off of my plate <laughs> when we went to Heathcliff, a recent Heathcliff. So I always not knew that I wasn't going to get to eat all that okra. <clears throat> he loved telling stories with his heart. Someone gave me a very large stretched canvas a few years ago, but it had already been painted on. So uh, I got out the wet sandpaper and the gesso. Several hours and twenty dollars worth of gesso later, I had a new canvas. I propped it out on my van in the driveway to dry. <coughs> the garbage people took it. <laughs> uh, they never took anything big before. <laughs> well, Don liking to tell the story did a painting to commemorate the, the uh, event. And he titled it, Never Put Your Painting Curbside on Garbage Day. <laughs> <coughs> Don always seemed like a big brother, even though um, he was 13 years older than, than me. Now, don't worry about the math. I'm 79. <laughs> Got that one figured out. When Don and I first started hanging out, his mom was still alive. And that's about 10, 12 years ago. And she would go with us to art events. Now I'm telling you, Ann Stone was this little bright light. She was so interested in everything. She wanted to know about everything. And she just was just so cheerful. You just loved to have her around. And I was always telling her what a good job she did raising Don because uh, maybe some of you didn't realize, but he was always so polite and, and helping you open the door for him. And back then I didn't need people to open doors for me, but he did. One day, not too long ago, I woke up with a terrible pain in my midsection. Several hours later, my doctor's nurse told me that I needed to go to the emergency room. So who did I call? I called Don and he said, I'll be there in 15 minutes. And not only did he come, he took me to the emergency room. 
He stayed with me throughout. It was gallbladder surgery. And that was a big joker, I'm telling you. And when I got home after my surgery, I found Don had cleaned my whole kitchen for me. <laughs> That wasn't the only time that Don was there for me. Sadly, in 2015, my son Jimmy Hill was killed in a weather-related car accident. Don volunteered to drive into the church. He arrived early. That was also Don. He was there. I had been up all night putting photographs together. You all know how I do that, all those all-nighters. And I was uh, burning up hot. I mean, my face was red as a beet, and I was just as hot as I could be. Don said, you go shower and get dressed, and I'll put this together. Now, putting metal frames together was not Don's long suit. He wasn't graceful. I mean, he wasn't. But by golly, he got the job done. When I came out of the shower and was dressed, I was still burning up hot. And Don, Don said, um, Don went to the refrigerator, got the ice out, and hi. Um, got out the ice, put it in the washcloth, and handed it to me. He said, hold this up to your face, cool you down. And he loaded the van, the van up, and off we went to the church. Well, we had to drive across town. By the time we got across town, all six blocks of ice were melted. I still wasn't totally cool. Don said, now you rest here and I'll take everything in. I'll come back and get you. Well, that's what he did. And I'll tell you folks, it was because of Don that I was able to deliver that eulogy for my son without crying. I don't know how I did it, but Don was there and Don helped. One day, Don and I were sitting in a sidewalk cafe in a beautiful little northern Florida town. Lovely, quiet day with lots of pretty girls around. I think it was probably a college town. Okay, here came along this guy on the motorcycle, just making noise like you wouldn't believe, just crushing, shattering the air with noise. And Don looked at me and he said, Don't tell him that. Say the words. <laughs> Who was Don Stone? He was a man so full of life. He loved life. He was a folk artist. He was a storyteller, but most of all, he was my friend. Tried and true, that's our dawn. Thank you guys for coming. Oh, Don gave me these, along with a whole box more glasses after my cataract surgery. I could see good, but I couldn't read a thing. <laughs> was, I been outside I've always marched to my own drum and I guess that would make me an outsider I find it very much a good place to be it's very comforting I had no art background it was you know it wasn't until I was in my mid 40s that I I started painting I never had an art lessons I mean really the only two art courses I ever had in school were art history, which, you know, I've always loved history. And um, it, it's, it's a quest for knowledge in that aspect. It's always been a comfort. You know, I grew up in the house where there were books falling all, off all the chairs around there. And so reading has always been a, you know, a great source. necessarily paint what you see you paint to see what you see and I just love it there are times you know they're paintings that paint themselves 
and uh, there are other paintings that you you fight and you fight and you fight and you put it down and I mean there are 30 or 40 pieces I've started and not finished because I don't know where they're going but it's just I love painting some paintings that just to see where I'm going with it and um, as my mind wanders and I love following it because it takes me to great adventures. I don't know, I mean, I'd like to, see, to look at me as being an educator to get you to think, you know, what stories can you tell? Should you, do you need to retain this? Do you need to pass it on? I mean, I'm, you know, there's this house is full of family stuff that, you know, pieces to go back 100, 200 years. And I find that, you know, this next, this coming generation, they don't quite understand the need for it. One of the things I lament was not asking my grandparents, you know, more about their life and their stories. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I should have listened more. I think that's the biggest thing is we, as children or young adults, don't listen. I wish we had the knowledge we had as an older person middle-aged and whatnot, to hear the stories when, um, there's another quote, when an old person dies, a library closes. And I think that's very important, to have the stories. One of my frustrations in my paintings is there's so much there's a lot in my painting that are they going to get the story will they understand um, and I find you know I'm frustrated that I haven't found a way to communicate that you know all the stories whether it's important to the, uh, the person who's viewing it, I don't know. It's important to me. I had to come up with an artist statement. And I said, I like color. I like positivity. And if I can make you smile, if, you, if I can make you laugh, you've gotten my message and I've done my job. And that should be life.